Patrick Hostis here. Hope you're all doing well. So I wanted to talk a little bit today about a couple of subjects, uh, one of which, well, they're both tied together, one of which is very close to my heart, actually. And to be clear at the outset, um, as far as Korea goes, I'm not an impartial observer. Half my family's in South Korea. My wife's Korean. Uh, my kids are half Korean. I lived, when I was in the military, I was stationed there for a while, and it's a country and a culture that I fell in love with, and I've been tied to for about 17 years now. So it's certainly something I keep an eye on, and I've, I've researched and, and all that, and I've experienced uh, what it's like to be in the military in the military situation over there. So I, can, I know a little bit about what I'm talking about when I discuss Korea. But the first thing I wanted to go over was this war fever that has been going on, I think, about maybe a month into the Trump administration. It's just, it's been nonstop, balls out, war fever, whether it be Syria or, you know, getting involved back in Iraq or whatever. It's just all these, you know, I just find it so shocking that people like John McCain, who was in Vietnam and was a prisoner of war and... H.R. McMaster, who is now the National Security Advisor, he was also a, uh, he was in the Battle of 73 Eastings in uh, the Gulf War, so he's seen warfare. He was in Talafar in Iraq. It was, uh, he was in charge of a town there that things were pretty, uh, you know, as Iraq was falling apart, he, he managed to keep that area pretty stable. So he's an able general, he's, he's seen warfare, and so is McCain, but it's like these guys have never met a war they didn't like, you know, and, and that bothers me when these guys, because I've seen war myself in Iraq, and I certainly don't want to see it again, and I certainly don't want to see it again if there's any other options, but these guys, they just seem to love war. And, you know, McCain, I mean, he was all for giving weapons to anybody in Syria. He d didn't seem to care who the hell they were. You know, just airdrop weapons to the rebels. You know, the rebels that cut off little kids' heads and things like that. Those peaceful rebels. You know, he wanted to just do that. And he wanted to get involved in Syria and topple Assad. I mean, this guy just loves war. I mean, I don't know well, what the hell's wrong with him. But there's something wrong with this man. I mean, they just have the sick fetish with war. You know, maybe it's because it's, it's not going to be their ass on the line. I don't know. But anyway, you know, he's constantly in this Korea crisis now. Now he's jumped all over this, you know. You see him shifting towards that. Well, I'm not going to get him. I guess he feels like he's been blocked in Syria, even though I still think that that's going to be a problem in the future. But I guess, you know, he's turned all of his attention there. Now he's just telling that, oh, we, we're going to have to do something. We're going to have, you know, he's pushing this war fever. And, and so you've got all these basically scumbags who love warfare pushing Trump to start a war. And, you know, sometimes I think Trump buys it, and then sometimes it looks like he doesn't, but I don't know, and I don't know, it, it, it's, I go back and forth on it, but I, it bothers me that, for example, you know, that, that I don't know how much store, truth is in this, but it really bothered me when that, that, you can't really trust the media, but it came out that, you know, that, uh, Ivanka, I guess, cried or something when she saw the video of those children that were gassed in Syria, and that's what kind of made up his mind, and I believe that came from Trump's son. Trump's son told that to somebody in the media that, uh, yeah, yeah, my, my sister crying really pushed a decision or whatever. And, you know, okay, so that was an emotional decision, right? <laughs> so you, you didn't base it off of, hey, you know, let's, what's going to be, what's in the best interest of the United States or anything like that? You just, you know, you saw an atrocity, Somebody cried and you decided to launch a missile. I hope there's a lot more to that story than that part, but I got to tell you, that one little snippet kind of scared me because there's atrocities that happen like that all over the world. Maybe not with chemical weapons, but all over the world it happens. It's happening in North Korea right now. It happens in China. It happens numerous, all over, all over Africa. There's crying, you know, there's horrible atrocities happen every day. So you can videotape any one of those and, and demand war in that area you know for this faction or that and that kind of scares me when people can be that easily you know that that siren song drags them into war like that i don't know i find that a little disconcerting but you know it, it i don't know it seems to, to be a kind of a consistent theme though with these folks and going back to mcmaster 
So McMaster, you know, he replaced Flynn when Flynn was outed for lying to to Pence or, you know, all that, the Russia connections and all that, whatever. It's, it's a dead issue as far as I'm concerned because he's out of the job, but the left-wing media, of course, is going to bring it up for the rest of Trump's natural life and probably even after that. So that's just the way it's going to be. But anyway, he was outed, so McMaster was put in. And at first, you know, I thought, oh, good, you know, because I knew the name from when I was in Iraq. I'd, I'd known about what he was doing, and I knew he'd fought in Battle 73 Eastings, which is a battle I'd researched in the first Gulf War. You know, and so I, oh, it's good. You know, and I'd read his book, Dereliction of Duty, which ironically enough is about the Joint Chiefs of Staff and them leading the basically Johnson into Vietnam by basically not serving him correctly and telling him all the problems and pitfalls and basically telling him the truth and basically blundered him into a, a giant war that cost, you know, 58,000 lives. Um, and ironically enough, now I think McMaster's is making the same mistake. I really do. So Cernovich came out yesterday. Um, I believe it was yesterday. And, and, you know, he has sources that are within the National Security Council, apparently. And they're saying that McMaster apparently wants wanted 150,000 troops or something in Syria, and apparently a lot of the principals weren't going to go for that. Thank goodness. So they didn't go for that, and you know whatever it. Another story came out and said, well, it was only 50,000. But you know what? Once you hit that, you know, 10,000, 20,000, it really starts to be a slippery slope. I mean, once it goes over a few thousand, I don't think you know. Maybe somebody, it'll be a big deal when it reaches like the 300,000 mark or something, but it doesn't draw that much attention. So, you know, to me, they can play games with the numbers all they want, but uh, the fact of the matter is, I don't, we shouldn't have boots on the ground there anymore because every time we do, we make things worse. Matter of fact, every time we involve ourselves in these affairs militarily, we make things worse. But I, I guess all these smart, uh, educated people like McCain and McMasters just don't quite get that. You know, maybe, I, I don't know, maybe you lose part of your mind when you get into the upper levels of the government. I, it seems that way because I got to tell you, in some, some regards, I think Trump's changed too. But we'll, we'll see. So anyway, he didn't get what he wanted with the 150,000 troops in Syria. So now... He wants $35 billion for Afghan and uh, Afghanistan, you know, for some package or whatever bunch of craziness he wants to do up there. And, of course, he's getting a lot of feedback or a lot of pushback from other principals. You know, that's kind of crazy. And another thing, this really scares me. This is what McMaster said, you know, when asked about, I guess, what this $35 billion is going to be used for or whatever. He says to create an inclusive government. Oh, goody, more regime change. That's awesome. Do you want me to tell you how that has worked out every single time we've done it recently? As in, <laughs> for the last 20, 30 years? It works really bad, and it gets, and, and we suck at it. And it, and, it, and it, you know, of course, brings us into a quagmire, into wherever the area is. You know, you can go back to Vietnam, and there was coups all over, you know, the CIA assisted with Diem being, you know, Cooed. Apparently, they didn't want him killed, but I mean, gee, I, I find it hard to believe they didn't think that was going to happen, but whatever. Anyway, he was killed. After that, the South Vietnamese government was completely fragmented for the remainder of its time. I mean, it was just a absolute, you know, dead man walking, that government, as far as after we started to play regime change with it. And now they want to do the same thing again, I guess, because Afghanistan's not enough, inclusive enough, as Michael Savage would say, inclusive enough. It's not an inclusive government. So whatever the hell that means, um, I'll tell you what I think the definition of this is. I think it is an excuse to drag us into another neocon-sponsored war. That's what I think it is. And, you know, we all must remember that McMaster is a protege of Petraeus. And Petraeus is another globalist, you know, CFR man who basically never saw a war he didn't like either. And so you have these three knuckleheads you know and there's others there's cohen there's you know others in the national security council that are dangerous people who love war and have a real fetish for it and these people i think i mean do you really think they're giving like clear appraisals to president trump because i'm kind of guessing they're not i'm assuming they're shading it certain ways and that's what scares me about final topic i want to get over go over and that is korea 
Now, these ballistic missiles that North Korea has and is threatening the world with and, and playing all these you know, games, and I'm not suggesting there's any other options rather than military, but just hear me out. So, I'm not quite understanding what the urgency right now is, because I'll tell you how it looks to me. It looks to me like the globalists got blocked with their Syria plan, at least uh, initially. It looks like they have, they're not going to get the giant ground war that they want to battle ISIS and Assad and Iran and whoever else they want to go to war with. They didn't get their way right there. So now it looks like they're kind of pushing on an open door with Korea because this missile threat's been around for a while. They're an easy target. They always say the stupidest things that in you know piss off everybody and make the entire world hate them. You know, so they're kind of like your fail-safe war. You know what I mean? Like if you, if there's like a place that you need a bad guy. I mean, there's always North Korea. I mean, you can always go there. So it kind of, you know, I, I question the timing is what I'm saying. I'm not suggesting there's any other ways to deal with North Korea than eventually a military confrontation. But I would much rather see a coup or something like that happen. But I'll, I'll talk about that in another podcast sometime. But there is some good possibility. There is a good possibility there could be a coup there. And I've actually been researching that. So I'll have a video out about that pretty soon. But more on that later. So the importance of now, why now we have to deal with this, why now we have to send these aircraft carriers there, why now, why now, why now? It just appears to me that things are being artificially brought to a boil. And I would really hate to find out it's because a bunch of people are manipulating the intelligence or manipulating Donald Trump or doing whatever to put the chess pieces in such a way to ensure that we get into some kind of cl conflict. Because that just seems to be the number one priority for these for the establishment is to get Donald Trump and this administration mired into some kind of a conflict, and it doesn't seem to me that they're very judgmental about <laughs> where that battle's going to be. You know, I saw on Fox News they they did a poll and said 53 percent of Americans want a military solution to this problem. You know, the problem in Korea. You know, and I'm just like, well, did anybody ask the South Koreans? Because they're the ones that are going to die. You know, there's 2 million people who live in Seoul, and there's 400 at least artillery guns pointed at Seoul right now from the north, plus ballistic missiles, chemical weapons, all kinds of other little goodies in the north's gotten from their buddies in China. And that's another thing. Why Donald, If Donald Trump thinks China is going to solve our problems for us, then he's a bigger fool than I ever believed because they're not. They've played this game for decades now. They always play this game. Do you know the Soviet Union forced North Korea to sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? It's true. Look it up. And all he had to do was say, you know what, I'll cut off your aid. And they signed immediately. They didn't like it. I mean, they, they'd whined and moaned and gotten out of signing it forever. And then finally Gorbachev basically said, sign it or I ain't giving you anything. And they just signed it. So forgive me, China, you know, they could have they could have hit the brakes a long time ago on this whole problem and they decided not to. So, you know, forgive me. I don't think they're going to ride in on the, on the unicorn and solve everything for us. But apparently Donald Trump thinks he, you know, and that always creeps me out when world leaders get this, these like warm and fuzzies about other world leaders. I mean, I know it's supposed to be a good thing, but you remember when Bush met with Putin and he said he saw into his soul or whatever, and it just, it, it creeps me out. I mean, I want people to get along and stuff, but Dude, this isn't like a bromance, okay? The, the Chinese Communist Party are not our buddies. They're diametrically opposed to everything the United States stands for. You know, so if you think that they're all of a sudden going to be our buddies and stomp on, you know, North Korea, I think you're, 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 reach, you're overplaying our hand. I don't think it's that strong. I think, that, I think China's going to pay us lip service. And now you see today they're doing weapons tests that are supposed to scare us. Be, you know, they're pissed about us putting in that THAAD missile defense system in South Korea. Oh really? These are our buddies, huh? That are that are gonna help the help us with North Korea. Yeah, the, turning back some coal ships isn't gonna s stop anything, and that's all they've done. That and say, you know, come on now, North, don't don't do this. That's about it. Now, I mean, I would assume they're getting a little irritated with the North's activities. So I don't know. You may, maybe we'll see a miracle, and all of a sudden, maybe this really is a bromance, and I'm totally wrong. 
and him and Trump are just best buds and they're going to work together. But I, I somehow don't think you're going to undo, you know, 60, 70 years of mistrust and communism, you know, overnight. But, you know, that's just me. You must remember that these these nations, and especially the national leaders, are supposed to look out for the interests of their nation, not our interest. So Trump's supposed to be looking out for what's best in our interest. And I just don't quite see what the interest in getting us mired into a giant conflict is, especially in some place like Syria. In Korea, I could see somewhat of a, a reasonable assessment that we have no other choice due to the fact that they do have nuclear weapons and that they are developing better ballistic missiles. So, and they've threatened everybody, I mean, from Japan to Australia to us. I mean, so yeah, they're a problem. But my problem is this, this kind of artificial pressure that's being put on, on these events. And, you know, I, I understand uh, Obama would sit back and do nothing, and that was a problem. And, you know, I understand, but I just, I think that the wrong people are stepping on the gas pedal is what I'm saying. When you have people, scumbags like Paul Wolfowitz, who are now talking to the National Security Advisor, you know, are you kidding me? Wolfowitz, if you don't remember, he was a deputy secretary of defense. He's, uh, he's the genius who really was uh, one of the, the brilliant minds that dragged us into the Iraq debacle that we're still dealing with to this day. Yeah, that was that moron. He's the idiot that on the night of 9-11, 2001, he's brought up, well, we should you know, look into invading Iraq. I mean, this scumbag was, he, he's another one who's never seen a war of conquest he didn't like. I mean, a war of any kind. I just don't understand these freaks. I mean, why they, they're into it, but I guess I'm just built different than them. But that's what I think. I don't know. I, I don't know. I think Syria is a completely r the wrong war for us. I think any regime change there is an absolute disaster. It's going to waste a lot of blood and treasure of ours for no reason. So I, I have no interest in that. And I think any neocon push to the contrary needs to be fought by uh, everybody. Because we don't need to, to bleed out in the deserts of some god-awful Middle Eastern country anymore. I'm tired of it. I saw it one time. I don't want to see it anymore. And I certainly don't want my kids there. So I think it's about time we let that part of the world just kind of, uh, you know, if Russia wants to deal with it, hey, have fun. It can be their own little Afghanistan, too, as far as I'm concerned. And as far as Afghanistan goes, I don't know about that situation. It's, you know, honestly, I haven't followed it close enough lately, but this $35 billion new infusion of cash and money and then trying to create an inclusive government that whole phraseology scares the hell out of me because that just sounds like an awful lot of regime change vietnamish quagmire-ish bad stuff right there throwing a little jihadi a little isis that just doesn't sound like a good plan to me and as far as korea goes that's a much more delicate situation and there's a, the risks are very high like I said already, there's millions of, of South Koreans that are in the gun sites in the north basically being held hostage by the psychopath in the north. You know, the vermin up there that, that run that country and watch their people starve to death just make me sick. But there are some possibilities of other options of, of deposing this guy short of a full-scale war. I'm not saying that there, any of them are easy, but there are some out there. Um, I'll get into that more later in another podcast or something. But I want to know what you think. Do you think I'm right? Do you think I have a right to be scared on this? Do you think maybe the wrong people are pushing the gas on this Korea thing, on this war fever, or do you think I'm just being paranoid? Do you think that uh, you know this is the best thing for us? And do you think Syria was a good thing? Do you think we need to be involved in that? And do you think uh, what about Korea? Do you think we should just keep up with this pressure and possibly escalate all the way to war if necessary, or do you think we should? try different options. Let me know what you think.